welcome back to our next episode of the Fearless Future podcast. We are your hosts, Glenn. And Amber. Today, you are looking pretty uh, pretty dressy today, babe. Thanks. You have that little uh, sparkly dog collar on. I kind of like it. <laughs> you like it? I don't know. Can I may, may have to make this podcast a little short? Should I have to wear that later? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's very interesting. So I like the way that looks. So very good. So if you're not watching on YouTube, you probably should click around I, and subscribe and follow us on YouTube. So Didn't know you liked the dog collar look. I did. It looks, <laughs> looks very good, actually. So Learned something new today. Well, you're a freak about having things around your neck. So you hate having... You I hate, do. I, you, don't, I don't. I don't like things. I don't like tight things around my neck. I know. You're a weirdo about that. So you're making our daughter be the same way. Hey, today, <laughs> we're going to take a journey back in time today. And I think it's important that we look back and say to ourselves, okay, I'm 55 years old, you are 50. What will we tell our 40 year old self? So anybody who's a Gen Xer who's in that 40 range, I maybe they can learn from some of our mistakes and figure out what they would do differently. So I made a list of some things we should talk about today. Okay, hey, let's I do think it. you probably did too. So what are some things that I would tell my 40 year old self? And make sure you stay tuned to the whole podcast because we do have our stupid human comments and our lost, our Gen X lost memories moment yes. too. So make sure you stay tuned through the whole podcast to get uh, get the, the full effect of all this. Number one, for me, I think- so We're, we're going to focus on business stuff. We're not really talking about personal stuff here, what we would tell our 40-year-old self. We're focusing on our, our real estate career. We can talk about personal stuff, whatever. But let's talk about the business stuff. Let's start with that. So I think that one thing I would have done differently is I would have focused a lot more on building my rental portfolio when I was in my 40s. Yeah. We started and got a whole big chunk of them done. We have yeah. more than the average person, of course, but then I wish we had done more because- I, I wish we had started sooner. Like, started sooner. Like when we, when we first started in real estate, you had always wanted to do the rentals, yeah. but we needed cash and that didn't bring it right then. You know, yeah. we, we needed to flip um, just- logistically and financially, we were in a position where we needed to flip. But I, looking back, you know, hindsight's 2020, I wish we had started building our rental portfolio earlier. Yeah. I mean, for, for me, mathematically looking back, I say, okay, if whatever amount of houses that you have, we have 50 houses now, let's just say that's what we have. So we have 50 houses. So with, with 50 houses, when you, when the more houses you have, as appreciation happens across the whole market, you take advantage of that more when you have more assets, right? If you have one house and the property, let's just for easy math, a house is worth, you know, a hundred thousand dollars. Let's say, let's say $200,000. The house is worth $200,000. And then over the course of the next few years, that property increases to $250,000. That's a 25% increase. Let's say it's over five years, six years, whatever it is, as it appreciates, now you've made $50,000 on a $200,000 investment that you have. Well, if you have 10 of those, you just made a half million dollars when it right. appreciates. The hindsight part of this for me is looking back after COVID, who would have thought that real estate would have gone up as fast and as much as it has? Yeah. Enormous. The same houses that we used to buy and flip for 75 grand and sell them for 150. That was a pretty common thing. Yep. Our top line, most of the time, every house we sold was under 200,000. Right. Now they're around 300,000 every house. Yeah. So all those rental pro portfolios went up significantly and made us multimillionaires through all that appreciation. Right. Now, had I had more than that, we'd have been more than just multimillionaires. We'd have been up in the DECA millionaires in, in, in the DECAs, right? Yeah. Way up in there. And we're certainly on track for that, but it's, it, I think that the more you have, the more you can hedge your bet and also take advantage of situations like that. Now, downside might be people, people might say, yeah, but what if it goes down? Well, besides 2008, in our particular market in upstate New York, it didn't even go down then. Right. It just leveled out for a few years where it didn't have mass appreciation. And, and that was a real estate crisis. Right. That, that caused that. So that's an important part to, uh, to do. So how about you? What, uh, what's something that you would have done differently? T telling, talking to our um, forty-year-old selves. Yeah, I mean, one of the one of the things that I never did like was investing in New York. You know, and I kind of always have complained about that. Number one, it's a blue state; it's not landlord friendly at all. You always complain; I didn't even notice. Um, I know that there was nothing really I liked about New York. The only thing I still like about New York is some of my family's there and our dear friends. But yeah. other than that, I don't miss New York at all. Yeah. Um, but it, you know, it's a very blue state, not landlord friendly, and the taxes are crazy. They're, yeah. they're crazy high. Um, so I, I definitely would have liked to have diversified our portfolio into some other states, more red states, more landlord friendly states. So let's talk more about that. So where we live now in Florida, 
we have not purchased any any rental properties yet. as of yet. That's yet. that's a plan for us. We're deciding what we want to what we want to and where we want to invest. Yep. And plus, right now, interest rates are high, so it's not ideal to find a property that cash flows, and it's a safe time to do it. So it's still it's still a good t- it's always a good time to invest, right? It just it just what do I want to do with interest rates? I want to kind of just sit on it for a little bit and see what's going to happen. So I think it's important too to remember when pe- we talk about red states, you know. You talk about being landlord friendly. We should talk about what that means to people. Large part of it is evictions. You know, if there's, if you're in a a blue state that's not landlord friendly, evictions can just get drawn out and take bloody forever. And, you know, the blue states tend to have the squatters rights, which we've gone over in other podcasts. So it can be very difficult to get people out of your house if they're not paying rent, if they're not taking care of the house, you know, for, for whatever reason. I've always thought that the reason it was so ridiculous in New York was because of New York City. Yeah. Because of all the laws that came out of all the slum lords in New York City. Right. And I don't know if that's true or not, because California is worse than New York from what I've heard with getting people out. So I don't know where their problem is. In other well, words, I'm sure they have plenty of slum areas too. I'm sure. But but just New York, you know, where we lived, it was always like people owned these huge high rise buildings and they were slum lords and fix but, anything. But the tenants get more rights than the landlords. They a hundred percent get more rights right. than the landlord. There's no there's no balance of power there. The the liberal states say, no, you guys can do what you want. You should have housing. Everybody should have housing. But they forget the landlord has to pay the bills. Like the landlord pays taxes. The landlord pays Insurance, for the mortgage. The mortgage, insure, yeah. everything. Something's broken. They have to fix it. And yep. we do. I mean, that's so there's a lot of good landlords that get nailed out there. Even during COVID, states. there was the moratorium on, you know, you couldn't evict people if they oh weren't paying rent. Oh my God, remember that? We had that people that weren't hell. paying rent. And, you know, it was, oh, and, and we were able to sustain I it because we, we had enough that that it, it still made sense. Yeah, like we could still pay our mortgages. But if you had... You know, if you're a mom and pop and you have one or two rentals and that's your retirement income, like that's what you're living off of. And then all of a sudden you're in a state where they declare some sort of moratorium and people don't have to pay their rent. Yeah. Those people don't get tax breaks. They don't get a break on their mortgage. I mean, they're screwed. Then their credit gets ruined. They allow them not to pay rent. And when the tax bill comes due, you damn well know they're going to show up at their door knocking saying, hey, where are my taxes? Right. They want their taxes and the bank wants their mortgage. Right. So that was a crazy time. I, I, that was, that was our eye opening moment for me. That was a major eye opening moment of how much power we didn't have in a blue state. Yeah. Because they, I had forgotten all about that. Thanks for getting my blood pressure up today. But that they literally said, Oh, I thought it was a dog collar shirt that got your blood pressure. It was a different blood pressure. It was a different thing going on. (laughs) But there's a one house we had in Scotia on Eagle street. They stopped paying rent. We offered them like $3,000 to move out. They said, no, it's cheaper for us to stay here. Yep. And I had no comeback. Yeah. Like, no, it's cheaper for us to stay here. You can't, you know, 3000 bucks is nothing. Yeah. I, I can live here. And they lived there for two years without paying rent. Moratorium. And then the eviction process started. And they had dogs in the house, huge dogs, chewed everything, destroyed everything. Beautiful little cute house, too. Yep. Destroyed everything. We had to go back there and re- redo everything. Never got reimbursed for that. So that's a horror story about the rental. But as we're looking back, I just we're just looking back to what we would do differently. That where, tells where you red states, red states tend to be more landlord friendly than tenant friendly. So right. it's easier to do evictions. And I'm not saying, listen, be a good landlord. Take care yeah, of your people. Take care absolutely. of your tenants. Do all that. Provide a good home. Yeah. Be, good environment. A good, safe home for them. But by all means, when someone's not paying, that's not a good tenant. No. And of course, they have lots of problems when they're not paying. Right. They, they also, they call the code enforcement when they're not paying and whatever. Yeah. So anyways, we'll move along. But that's it. Tell my 40 year old self, we would have focused more on buying into red states. And, and you can do that because you can have a property manager. You don't have to live where you invest. It's better to have a place where you can, you can move people in and out and they're just, they're better off. And usually taxes are better in a red state too. You're not right. getting nailed with taxes. I would also, one thing that I would do that I wrote down is I would invest a lot more in multifamily versus just single family. And that people might find that shocking who follow us, but honestly- I think a combo would be good. Yeah. I mean, there's a reason why all these hedge funds are buying up single family homes too. I understand. So it, it's not like that's a bad investment. We would just, oh, diver- no. we would diversify and also do some multi. Overall, a single family doesn't really cash flow. If we're being honest about it, a single family cash flows a little bit, right. but not a lot. Right. Maybe it's a, a long term play. It might be a couple hundred bucks a month, but as soon as, you know, you're putting, you're putting aside money all the time. As soon as the roof goes and it's five grand or six grand or the eight furnace, grand, whatever. The furnace goes, it's four grand. Um, we, by the way, that one house was four grand. We just got fixed. It was yeah. supposed to be seven. We got to four, but you know, a furnace went. Yep. So any money you've made at 200 bucks a month profit is going to be it's gone, gone. Yeah. you know, after, you know, 20 months of that. So there's always something that comes up. So it might be cash flow positive for a little while, 
But when we look back over our records, all of our two families, they always cash flow, mm -hmm. right? They always cash flow because one, there's always a tenant in there. Usually it's very rare. They'd both be vacant at the same time. If you have a four unit, right? If a four unit building, what are the odds of all four people being out at the same time? Yeah. And I, I think that's important to say too, because I think sometimes when you, when somebody hears the term multifamily, they think of these big, huge apartment buildings, right? There's duplexes, there's triplexes, there's quadplexes, then there's eight units and 12 units. You know, you don't have to necessarily get into these. What about seven hundred... units? They have seven units maybe, or nine units? All or... right. Mr. Smart Guy. Just ask him. You know, I, I'm just saying you don't, you don't have to always get into these, you know, hundred unit apartment complexes no. or, or more. So don't, don't, you know, mistake that for. No, you can still get, you can still get basic loans on up to four, four right. families. And you're not usually having to bring in outside money to do that. You can do it yourself. And FHA now allows you up to 4%, about 5% down and get a mortgage from the government. Yeah. So that's a really great play. And you can do the house hacking. You could, you know, if you're just getting started, you could live in one of the units and, and have the other three pay your mortgage. If and, I was young and didn't have a huge family and didn't like to live on the beach, I would do that all day long. Yeah. Like go there and, and buy a four unit and, you know, manage the other three. Because in a few years time, you're going to have cash flow and you'll have assets. You probably live rent free. Right. Right. Because you don't have to pay right. for you. And But that's the beauty of having that. So I would definitely invest more in multifamily than in single families, yeah. just me personally. So I, I think we should pause now though. And I think we should do our stupid human comment. All right. Because I, I always not, have fun with these. I've not heard it this week, but let's see what our stupid human comment of the week is from a stupid human. All right. This one actually has his name and his handle. It's so what, what, give me, give me the context. What was the podcast about that or, uh, the, or the, the, the video about that he commented on? It must've just been something about being a landlord. Oh, good. Okay. Good topic All right. for this. So this is from James C. 7121. All right. It should be unlawful to be a landlord on the bank's borrowed money. That's scumbag shit and why rent is so expensive. There should be a law that states you must own the property outright before renting it out. That couldn't be stupider. Okay. <laughs> so yeah. Okay. Okay. James, where are you getting your information from? Where is your sense of reasoning here? Like what, what's behind this comment? Why, why on earth wouldn't you be allowed to rent a property if you still have a mortgage on it? Uh, you know, uh, that scumbag shit. If you how does that make us a scumbag? If you argue with an idiot, you, you become, become the, the idiot. idiot. <laughs> That's how this works. So there's no arguing with with what's his name? Robert James James. There's no arguing with James on this one because it just doesn't make any sense. I, I like, wouldn't even try. Yeah, like, that's it's pointless. Yeah, it's stupid to even say something like that. But. I don't know. Some people just have a lot of free time on their hands. And I guess that's a person that will never know about accumulating assets and accumulating wealth or never even buy their own home. And hey, hey, James, by the way, if you ever want to buy your own home, remember, you're going to have to have all cash for that. <sighs> How are you going to do that? Somehow I doubt you're going to have any cash for anything. Usually the people that write these kind of comments, though, they're bitter. They're bitter because they're not in a position, to, yeah. you know, like because if you if you understood the game. Yeah. And how life works and how finance works, you would never make a comment like that. People, uh, people hate you for your success. It's just kind of how it goes. The they more do. successful you get, the more the people, more haters, the haters come out. Yeah. Yep. And, and honestly, who cares? So James, thanks a lot for being the winner of the stupid human comment of the week. Yep. You the man. <laughs> All right, let's jump along. So, so what else would I tell my 40 year old self? And I think this is something that we start doing on a regular basis. I think it's important, but you go, ahead. Talk about it? Okay. you go ahead. So. I think that as you start accumulating more and more assets, you, sh you should, I would have told my younger self to look at the whole portfolio and make decisions based on performance over time. So in other words, let's say you have 10 units and you're saying, okay, as a portfolio, I make this much per month or very little, because you're not making a lot in single families, but whatever it might be, if it's all single families or, or whatever combination, look and say, which ones are my best performing properties and why? It was an anomaly. Was it that I had somebody paid a year in advance? You know, what, what was it? Yeah. And the next thing is, um, are there any properties that are not performing that are bringing this whole portfolio down mm -hmm. and dump them? Get your equity out and dump them. Because for some reason, they're not working. As a rental, they're just not working. It could be the area. It could be it's just a possessed house. It could be anything, right? There's some crazy things that happen. Sometimes you don't know why a house doesn't make money. It just never does. Yeah. You have more repairs than you expected. Right. And you're thinking to yourself, I have more stuff coming up now I got to pay for. So and there's important. some houses that just seem like they're, you know, bottomless pits for 
repairs and, yeah, the and mon- they, the money they attract the bad tenants or and then, then they, you know there's like every time there's a turnover the house has to be totally remodeled like there's just some houses that seem like they attract that you know you know sometimes you drive down or you know if you've lived in the same town for a long time there's always that one building that the restaurant never stays you know yes. it's always like yes. turning yeah. over to another, another over. kind of restaurant yeah. or, or and whatever why? and why it's in yeah. a good location it's right next to other great restaurants that have been yeah. there for 20 years but they like always sometimes, turn. sometimes you have a house like that the, the house is just like it's a, a crap magnet like it just yeah <laughs> attracts the bad stuff yeah so, so you gotta dump those and i i think one of the reasons that we weren't good at that and that we would go back and tell our 40 year old self that is we got so busy working um on the business right. that we didn't work in it enough. And that's, no, on, they would say were, we, we, were, we were working too busy in the business. That's right. To work I said on it backwards. The business, that, right? I said it backwards. Yeah. Right. So, so Maybe I think that collar is too tight on your neck. Or I think so. It's cut cutting off, off my flow. circulation. So I, I think that's really important thing to do as you're, as you're growing your business. Cause that's a, that can be a real downfall for your business. If you, if you don't focus on the right things. Yeah. Next thing I would tell my 40 year old self is to, take advantage of low rates yeah. and lock in at long-term fixed rates. We kick ourselves for that one. We were so busy, essentially kind of moving to Florida and our life was crazy on the personal side for quite a while there that I really wasn't putting a lot of thought into the debt structure on our portfolio. And we weren't anticipating the interest rates going up so quickly either. No, but you should always, as an investor, you should yeah. always know it's going to happen. So maybe just explain to everybody how it works. Most loans you get for a rental property are usually locked in for, let's say, 10 years, the 10 year note, and it'll adjust in five years based on the treasury. So the, the bank might say, well, the, well, whatever the treasury rate is plus zero or the treasury rate plus one or plus two. And so you know that in five years, you're gonna automatically adjust for another five years. Your payment will either go up or down depending on what the treasury rate is. Well, when you lock in at 4%, 5%, life's good, everything looks good, all of a sudden rates are now seven. And all of a sudden I'm thinking, uh oh, we have, loans coming due on houses we may have to sell some assets off to get out of those properties because we won't be able to afford them anymore because the numbers don't work anymore right well the bank wants you to do a cash out refi they want you to take more money out pay a higher rate and extend that loan which we may have to on some properties i don't know but i don't love that concept but we but we can do it but i think that looking back i had friends who were locking in at four percent for 30 years oh there were some awesome programs. You may have to pay a few dollars up front, like a points or, or some costs and all that costs stuff, to yeah. do that. But they locked in for 30 years. And again, now they are at very low rates for 30 years. And those properties will not, that the payment will stay low, but rents will increase. Mm-hmm. And as rents increase over the years, that payment still stays low. That gives you more and more and more cash flow as you pay down that debt. Yeah. So that's something that that was a, a tactical error that we made that we would like to uh, go back in time and fix. Yeah, our buddy Jeff says, marry the house, date the interest rate. Yeah. So even in today's market, when interest rates are a little higher, it's still a good time to buy for, yeah. for a few reasons. One, if interest rates do go back down, which hopefully they will some, hopefully around election time Pro- or whatever. Probably, probably not going that low, not, but yes. Not that low, but they probably should go back down. Um, then you can always refi at that time. But, um, you know, even if they don't, the house is still appreciating. And if, if your numbers work, if your mortgage is getting paid by the tenants, it's still a good deal. And the other thing is when interest rates do go back down, house prices are probably going to go back up. Yeah. So, people, so it's probably going to even out. Buy, yeah. People will jump in to buy more houses. So it's still not a bad time to buy houses is yeah. my point. Never is. This next one's you. We would, we would have started wholesaling earlier to offload the leads that we didn't want to work. You know, when we first started in our business, we were just cherry picking the deals that came across our desk that we this, wanted this to do for flips for flips. We want to do only flips. Right. And, yeah. and we had no interest in doing anything else. We didn't think that was sexy. We didn't think it was fun. Like we had no interest in it. There were so many deals that came across our desk that we just like threw in the trash because we didn't want to do them because they were in an area that we didn't like. They, we had too much going on at the moment. We couldn't add another one to our plate. You know, for one reason or another, we didn't want those houses. Yep. And so we could have taken, we, we probably left hundreds of thousands of dollars on the table. Oh, millions. Millions on millions the table. For, if we would have wholesaled those deals off to other investors. Well, define wholesale. People that don't know what wholesale is. So wholesaling is when you're basically just flipping the contract. So, you know, you put a house under contract for just easy numbers. Let's say $100,000. You, you sell it to somebody else for 30, 000, or 
and then you keep the thirty thousand dollars spread. Right, that's a simplified you, way. You, but that's, you, you're basically a matchmaker of buyers and sellers. You never, you never actually own the house. Right, you just sell the contract. But we, like you said, we probably left millions on the table. Yeah, by not doing that earlier in our career. Well, we'll you know, Signature Homeowners, our company in New York, will do over one point five million just in wholesales this year. This year. Just this year. So that's enclosed business. So that's a lot right. just for, for wholesale. So we left that on the table back in the day. So 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 in the beginning, and it's not just wholesales, we would have implemented multiple exit strategies instead of just being so laser focused on just doing flips, yeah. whether that's wholesaling, whether it was adding houses to our rental portfolio, whatever. We we would have implemented those exit strategies yeah, a lot sooner had sure. we known better. All right. Time for one of my favorite segments today. It's Gen X lost memory time. Let's make sure we uh, set this one up a little bit. So this is going to be pretty obvious and it's pretty much in theme with today's episode about going back in time. So without further ado, let me play you the clip from a movie today. and You tell me what movie this is from. Wait a minute. Wait a minute, Doc. Uh, are you telling me that you built a time machine out of a DeLorean? The way I see it. If you're going to build a time machine into a car, why not do it with some style? <laughs> All right, I knew it as soon as he said Doc. I mean, <laughs> and how could I not know this movie? Because <laughs> even if I didn't see it like way back when, you have a man crush on Michael J. Fox. I have loved that guy. And you watch this movie anytime it's on TV. This is Back to the Future, I of love course. that guy since his first show in Family Ties and the oh movie Secrets of My Success and yes. Teen Wolf and Back to the Future, all, all of them. Yeah, no, what, a, what an amazing... Uh, I look back, you know, I, I, that, there's hardly a weekend on that's not playing. One of the, one of the Back to the Future is not playing someplace. So what a, uh, what a successful movie yeah, that was. My, my man loves his rerun movies. <laughs> I do. Sometimes I just like to not think about things and just be able to catch a movie midstream. And like, that's just me. I like Wait, to We haven't that. even been able to, th this is funny. So we haven't been able to even cut the cord in our house because, because you like to just scroll TV and see I what do. movies are on. I do. Like you could probably like do them all on demand on yeah, but Netflix. I want to like, like, just scroll through. If I see Back to the Future, I just stop and go, what part is this? So we paid a hundred, we pay a hundred bucks a month so I can scroll the TV. Yeah. It's ridiculous. I know. I know. I don't even watch TV that much. That's the I funny know. part. I probably watch. I'd be lucky if I watched 10 hours a week because we watch you know, in the evenings. We usually we binge, our we, binge it, we binge a show. But other than that, outside that, I probably watch three hours a week. I don't watch much TV at all. It's always reruns and old stuff. So it's just how I like it. All right. So let's move along. We got a couple more things and then we'll wrap up today's episode. So what would I tell uh, my 40 year old self? And I think that one of the most important ones is start thinking about your your investing business as a business. Mm -hmm. We first started, it was like, let's just flip a house. We wanted to make a lot of we money. We were hustling. Yeah, let's make up. And then we flipped the next house. And then we started thinking to ourselves, well, this needs, we, we should think about it like a business. Like it took, it took a year or two to hire an assistant. Yeah. And start thinking about maybe we could do more. So even if you do just a few a year, I can't stress enough to be thinking of it like a business. Now, what do I mean? Thinking of it like, how do I put a system in place so that, I don't have to do all the work forever, right? What's my system for having somebody run the leads that I bring in How to find the deals, which is a realtor. As we did that early on, we hired a realtor. Yep. How do I have somebody manage the project? Could be a part-time person that you hire, whatever, to manage the project. Could be somebody retired, whatever, but you can start there. And then start thinking of it like a business. Like, how do I structure this with the right you know, LLC and the right, the right, what state does the LLC need to be in and how, how should I best set this up for taxes? But start thinking of it like a business because otherwise you're doing stuff in your own personal name and you're liable for things and you shouldn't be. But I would say start, you know, I don't know the average number, but the, in gross sales, gross sales, a lot of businesses barely get to three, $400,000 a year. Your little, your little mom and pop shops, they might do three, 400,000 a year, a little trinket shop on the beach down here, they probably do 200 grand a year, if that. That's their top line in sales. You flip a house, your top line in sales is 300, if the house is 300 grand, that's 300 grand. You do two houses in a year, it's a $600,000 business, mm -hmm. right? Or if yeah. you live in California, you're doing million dollar homes, it's a million dollar a year business, that's the top line. Right. Now you're trying to drive a 20% profit. profit at the bottom line, like any business is. So if you're selling a $300,000 house, you should make $60,000, that's for that. You're selling a million dollar house, right? You yeah. should be, you should try to make 200 grand on that house. So there's, there is a lot to be said for thinking about it like a business out of the gates. So a lot of people just don't. Yeah. It's funny. I'm thinking about the conversation we have with your brother, Gary, when we 
weren't that deep into our business right. yet, but we were trying to make a $25,000 profit on every flip. $20,000 $20, profit on every flip that we did. I thought it was 25. No. But whatever, that's no, neither here nor there. So, <laughs> so regardless, but we were trying to make $20,000 on a profit on a flip, whether yes. the house was, you know, whether the ARV, the after repair value was $150,000 or $300,000, right. which wasn't the smartest way to do it. No. Your brother challenged us to make that a percentage right. versus just an, a flat fee number. Right. And that changed our business. It did because we started looking and saying, listen, we have to have enough margin on the job to account for any problems. And right. a bigger a house, bigger the problems. Right. More holding costs, right? That, that's all a big thing. So it wasn't enough to just make 20 grand anymore. We said, let's make more. And then we started to make 50 and 100 and right. 75 and thousand dollars on every um, deals and that made a big difference right. so it was a, it was a huge difference so yeah that was a big so i i think another thing too that um would, would I, I would tell my even younger self this like trust your gut more because every time our gut said had said something yeah, so like if, if we would have looked back and been able to whether it's firing someone that you know is not working out whether it's you know the con man, like we, yeah. we, we hired a con man at one point. Of course, we didn't know he was a con we'll man at the time. We'll do a separate episode about that. That'd, yeah. be a, that'd be a good one. Um, but you know, there were, there were some things our gut said about that. The interest rates, like I, we did have conversations about refinancing a lot of our rental portfolio at that yeah. time, but it was complicated. You yeah. know, there were a lot of them. They, you know, we'd have to come up with the closing cost and like, but we should have trusted our gut and done it at that time. Like just buckled down and, and done it. Yeah. I mean, I, I can't, count how many times we said, I, I knew, I knew I should have trusted my gut. I should have trusted my gut. I just told you, I'm reading a book called Essentialism. And I was just, I just told you the other day, I said, when you're, when you're doing things in your life, if it's not a hell yeah, it's a no. Yeah. And so if you're not really all in, so just what you said, you know, when something's a hell yeah, yeah you should do something. Your gut is telling you, you can call it God, you can call it your gut, you can call it the, the world, the universe, whatever you want to call it. But something's telling you your body is telling you, hey, listen, you should do this. And so or not do it or yeah. not do it. And you should listen to that. I agree yeah. with you 100 percent. And if something if something, you know, is a hell yeah, I have to I should do this. Yeah. You should stop what you're doing and do it. Yep. Because your body is telling you that for a reason. So that's, that was a really, uh, really good point. So. All right. Last but not least, let's talk about replacing yourself earlier rather than later. Yeah. And I talked about that a little bit before, but I think, you know, when you first start, you do, we, we did everything. We were all the hats. Right. We, we were, we were buying houses. Buying, we were, selling, designing. We were doing the work. We did the work on the first three ourselves. Remember, we wanted um, to be contractors. We bought, we bought all, all the, the tubs and the tools. Yeah. I, I was so proud of myself for going to Home Depot, buy a bunch of tools that people that know me laugh now. We go, felt very resourceful. You had tools. Yeah. So um, we were, you know, doing the books, we were doing the receipts. Like we, we were, we were wearing all the hats. Yeah. So definitely replacing yourself sooner than later. And, and I think a big misconception of that, and we've talked about this on other podcasts too, is a lot of people, even when they're getting into flipping, they think if I do all the work myself, I'm going to make more money. That, that holds true, whether it's, you know, doing the work yourself on the, the house itself or doing the accounting or so many different aspects of your business, you could apply that to if you can learn to delegate and, and there's that book, who, not how, mm -hmm. yeah, that's you know, that, that's a great book to, that applies to this subject. Um, you know, if you can find the who to take care of that, then that frees you up to do the more money making activities like right. finding the next deal. Right. So, but you don't always think about that when you're brand new in your business, you're just so eager to get yep. your hands dirty. It's nothing wrong with that because you do learn a lot through the process, but as you learn, start to systematize your business write down the systems that are working for you. So when you hire somebody else, you can say, here's a system I want you to replace and do this. And it might be a VA that does those things right. to start. We didn't have VAs were really a thing back then. Right. But now there's VAs that can help you with things like that. And I, I know- VA is virtual assistant that you can go you. on You're Fiverr. Right. Or, you know, you can find those there online. Place over yeah. the world. Maybe some in the US, but they're a whole lot cheaper overseas. Yep. And, and to them, it's, a, you know, our dollar is worth a lot of money over there. There are agencies that help you find there VAs. Are. Yep. A lot of ways to find those. And there's some great, really smart, highly really educated great. people. Yeah. People think, well, they're the Philippines. They'll smirk at the people. Well, they're people. Our, right? <laughs> our, our bookkeeping team is in India and they are phenomenal. We've had them for about five years. We have Alan who's on. Alan's, I think, in the Philippines. He's been with us for- Yeah. Six years now, seven years Our team as a loves VA. Him. Yeah, and he's a huge part, and he's he's a he's a virtual assistant. Yeah, but he's there all the time. So anyway, there's a lot of ways you can replace yourself, and there's we could spend a whole episode on that. But I think when you start getting the mindset of hey, I want to be a business owner, I want to replace myself because someday I'd like to be flipping houses when I'm not doing the work, and I want to be in a beach managing this from my computer, yeah. and that's what we've been able to do. 
So it's been great. So those are the things that I would tell my 40 year old self to uh, get to a better place by the time I was 55. But too bad I don't have a time machine or a DeLorean or I could go do that. That and don't sweat the small stuff. And it's almost all small stuff. Very true. Another great book. That concludes this episode of the Fearless Future podcast. If you liked it, make sure that you click that like button and also subscribe and turn on notifications. 